I groan daily. Man, I groan. Just yesterday I woke up with the stiffest neck. I don't know if it was how I slept or what. And I had like a muscle knot in my shoulder. It felt like a tennis ball adding to it. Before breakfast, I went down and had a workout in the garage. And that involved me jumping around doing star jumps and stuff with the shoulder that I dislocated at the beginning of the year. And yes, there were several audible groans throughout that workout. Not only that, I had a dental appointment yesterday afternoon, which of course uh, involved her just probing my gums with her little toy car tire pump, you know, tss, 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 ah, what? Bit of air in the wrong place, and I was groaning in the chair. To top that off, on my skateboard ramp last night, I came off and the board went into my Achilles tendon. And it's been tender ever since, and I groan when I walk. Yesterday, I was consistently groaning in pain. But you know what? It was a good day. It was a great day. I felt healthy. I had clean teeth. I wasn't sick or majorly injured. I was just walking around quite happily which anyone over 40 knows, hurts. And I haven't even mentioned my knees or hamstrings. I groan all the time. We groan because we're wasting away. We groan when we witness loved ones waste away. I visited my father-in-law this week. He has advanced dementia just the simplest manoeuvre, trying to put his foot on the pad of the wheelchair gently caused him such distress. He was groaning in pain. To see him in that condition causes our heart to groan. It's hard on my wife. It's hard on him. It's hard on his wife. We're all groaning in the pain of life. We pray for the persecuted church, our vulnerable brothers and sisters who are mistreated, denied justice, or even locked up. Zertan's father is locked up. As we speak, they groan in their suffering. We groan in our hearts and prayers. Not only do we groan in pain, but surely we groan in shame too, don't we? Repetitive sin we swore we wouldn't do again. Oh, Selfish ambition that places us and all the things we love in life above our God. Oh, sorry. Failure to live up to our calling. Failure to control ourselves. We did it again. Failure to love God and others as we should. As we want to. We don't groan alone. Everybody groans, yes. Everybody is in pain and wasting away. But there is a special groaning that we, the church, because we are God's children, discharge. It is the groaning of suffering with Jesus. Romans, I added two verses preceding. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, Heirs of God, God is our inheritance, and co-heirs with Christ as such, the kingdom is ours also. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Did you see if? What's with if? 
I thought the gospel story was that Jesus suffered and we go free. He gets punished, we get rewards. He drinks that cup of suffering we could never drink, and he did, and we could never. Therefore, we don't have to drink suffering. We go free and easy. Free? Yeah. Easy? No. It is true that Jesus' suffering stands tall and unrivaled and unsurpassed. But it's also true that he shared in our sufferings, and he did when he humbled himself to take on flesh. But it's also true that the Christian life is not just a matter of us suffering for Jesus, or Jesus suffering for us, or Jesus suffering with us, but us suffering with him. There's a little difference between him coming to earth and suffering with the humanity that he took on and all that he went through and the call on our life now is the church to suffer with him. We haven't experienced a lot of it in the West. But just as the world hated Jesus first, so we should expect time of rejection and hate when it runs its full course, when it's not inhibited by any other factors like etiquette. There's hate for our adoption into the family of God. Far from balk at these sufferings, Paul said, my goal is to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Paul counted nothing in this world to be grasped or held. He was more than happy to leave it. In fact, longed to leave it. He wanted to be resurrected with Jesus. Who doesn't? And this, of course, meant he wanted to suffer with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He wanted to taste and touch and smell with Jesus, talk with Jesus, live and die with Jesus. He had the heart and the mind of Jesus, as we do. We have the Holy Spirit. As the children of God, siblings of Jesus, there's a special suffering that accompanies our adoption. It is a suffering in this world that is sick and dying, and that is opposed to God. But that suffering is only temporary. And therein lies our hope. That's why in verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, they're not even worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. We suffer, but just wait. Our suffering with Jesus is not the reason we are God's children. By the way, that's the free gift of grace. But rather, our suffering with Jesus is the revelation that we are God's children. If we're suffering with Jesus, it's good. That's why we should be joyful. Consider it pure joy when we suffer with Jesus. Because it's an indication that we're being revealed as his children. Verse 19, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. When God's children are revealed, they're not upset. See, there is a suffering now and there's a glory to come. That denotes and reveals the children of God. From this world's perspective, the servants of God are invisible and insignificant. There are great advancements to the kingdom of God and people are being saved through sacrifice. No one cares. No one cares. 
the church, God cares. Just as our Lord was insignificant to the world, He's totally insignificant. He's the creator of all things. No one cares. But he will be revealed in the end as glorious. And so will his children with his coming. That revelation will be something. And from the church's perspective... There will come a time in the end when we're fully revealed for who we are, even to each other, even possibly to ourselves. No more groaning in shame. The battle between the flesh and the spirit's over. You know where we don't do what we want to do and we do do what we don't want to do? Over. No groaning. The fruits of the spirit that unfortunately are so often dehydrated or rotting on the branch and falling to the ground for lack of living water, no more. There will come a time when we're revealed for who we actually are. We don't know what a glorified Christ-like Christian is. We've never seen one. Never seen one. We don't know what we will look like with our blemish. We will be shocked at the glimpse of our own reflection if we ever catch it in the glory of Christ. We eagerly wait in anticipation and we eagerly wait with all creation. Every inanimate every sensible creature, all of creation. It's in harmony and mutual dependence. It's a fascinating and glorious and miraculous work of art from the Creator God. However, it groans like us and with us. And furthermore, It groans because of us. Verse 20, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. Who subjected creation to futility? Adam did meritoriously. God did judiciously. Creation was delivered to Adam to steward in in God's image. And when he delivered himself over to sin, he also delivered creation over to bondage and decay. You ever wondered why this is the kingdom of Satan, this world? It was given to him. Adam delivered it with himself and his mandate. What a failure of creation care. What a failure. And then God, in his divine judgment, passed a sentence on all of creation for the sin of humanity. So now, creation is subjected to futility. That is, deformity, impurity, which creation has contracted at the fall of humanity, and it groans. We can almost hear it. We can hear it. Much of its beauty is gone. There is enmity over one creature and another. And even that between creatures and humanity. The creatures are often abused to the dishonor of their creator. 
they are captivated by the law of sin that abuses and neglects them at the hands of fallen humans. And this is not willingly. This was not their choice. This was not even its fault. This is God's judgment on the choice of one man and his descendants who are just like him. What a mess. We join together with creation and groan for the coming renewal. You see, our God is a God of hope. And that's how we know our God subjected this creation to futility because it says here he subjected it in the hope. Satan's never going to subject anything in any hope. This is God subjecting it in the hope. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together. That's now, this, that's now all of us groaning in unison, in chorus. We don't groan alone. We're groaning together with labor pains, labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, the church, Christians, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. You know, there's a huge difference between death pain and labor pain. I've experienced several of both. Probably more labor pain than death pain, I've witnessed. But I know death pains are full of misery, angry pain, regret even. I know labor pains are full of hope and joy. The time has come. The hope of the birth of something new accompanies labor pain. The exceeding joy of beholding that which has been birthed accompanies labor pain. We groan in labor pain. So when? Not if, but when we care for creation as Christians. We steward this beautiful gift of God's creation that has been delivered into our care, that groans with us, and yet is subject to our sin, undeservingly. We care for creation because it's right. That's why the church cares for creation. If it doesn't, something's not right. To not care for creation is fundamentally wrong. That in itself is another expression of this curse of sin for which we need to repent and care for creation. As Christians, how could we worship another way? We groan and join with creation. We don't groan alone, but we don't groan without hope. We groan with hope and joy as Christians in chorus with creation. We actually look after one another. Because we know these are groans of labor and not death. And they accompany hope and joy. We know God himself will give birth to a new and an exceeding eternal joy. With a new heaven and a new earth with new bodies for us in incorruptible joy and glory. That's the future. The earth's part of it. A new heaven, 
a new earth to Peter, but based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. That's our hope. That's the hope of eternity for us. Not floating on a cloud with a harp. That might actually be the other place. At the end of the video montage I played there, some of you will have noticed and possibly recoiled even at the um, statement that was made. If we don't protect nature, we can't protect ourselves. That's how the world thinks. that we can somehow protect nature. From whom? The one who subjected it to futility? Shall we protect the world from God? Or protect it from what? The fiery judgment? that is to come with the return of Christ? When heaven and earth pass away and give way to the new, are we going to protect the earth from that? Do we want to? Furthermore, the idea that we can protect ourselves is just as futile. But can you see what an incredibly stressful predicament the world has living as people who groan in a groaning planet without hope? Those groans are death groans. That's why they're stressed. There's no hope in this futility of this world without God. And yet God subjected this world to fertility in hope. Pretending that we can save the planet is a stress we're not meant to bear. The futility of creation is designed that way. It is designed to make us see the gravity of sin. You groan, think of sin. You see this world decay and fall apart, think of the gravity of sin. And then, hopefully then, we will see the glory of Christ who conquers sin and death. That's what it's designed for. That's what we're meant to do with this groaning planet. See the gravity of sin unto the glory of Christ, who has dealt with sin and death and promises a new heaven and a new earth forever and ever. We can't save creation, but we can be saved by the Creator. And then, it's our mandate as partners in groaning to care for creation. Just as Charlotte spent six months doing and excited to do with the rest of her life as an expression of worship. What a beautiful thing to do with your life. Worshipping our creator who is making all things new in Christ. Let's pray.